Who are the main colonial players in Africa today? Is it the United States, China, uh, and, and France? Is it yes? And so, and and what are the different methodologies that the three? What do they each use to play the the great game okay. in Africa in 2019? Okay, very good. France controls uh, most of the former colonies in West Africa by controlling the economies. So, in other words, I forget what the percentage is. I think at one point it was 80 percent. Of their uh, uh, of their reserves deposited in the French Central Bank, and France would then uh, invest their funds on their behalf, and obviously they had no they have no control over that. Um, if things go wrong, too bad. Uh, but by being also so tightly tied economically with France, it means that the economic policy that is set uh, in France, including whatever the French, the value of the French currency is, affects all those countries uh, directly. And occasionally when things get a little bit astray, of course, France either intervenes directly militarily, as it did in the Ivory Coast uh, when there was uh, disputed elections, and France uh, favored uh, one candidate. Uh, uh, France intervened militarily. Mm -hmm. And France can also get other African countries to intervene on its behalf, as it did in Burkina Faso in 1987, when Thomas Sankara who was seen as a challenge to the, uh, the French vision of Africa, uh, was assassinated by his uh, supposed comrade, Blaise Compare. That was directly under the influence of France and the then president of uh, Ivory Coast, Côte d'Ivoire, uh, Félix uh, Hoffé-Bouigny. So that's how France uh, uh, exercises control, economically, financially, as well as uh, militarily, directly, or through surrogates. Um, uh, the China, mm -hmm. China, by offering billions of dollars in uh, loans, because China is uh, greatly expanding economic power and needs a lot of raw materials, and that comes from African countries. So China is willing. In fact, I think China-Africa trade is uh, about 150 billion dollars a year compared to U.S. Africa trade, which is about 40 billion. So that mm -hmm. gives you just uh, an idea about the magnitude of uh, China's involvement. China, uh, uh, some months ago, invited several African presidents to uh, China and offered $60 billion in investments. Uh, supposedly with no strings attached. You know, that's an impossibility, of course. Because, <laughs> right, right. yeah, you're going to end up mortgaging uh, some of your major assets or uh, utilities or uh, mines, you know. So that's how China exercises its neocolonial regime in Africa, which is very interesting because in 1960, I think I pointed this out in one of the earlier shows, and we both know that the... Figures like GDP per capita income, they can be worthless. But at the same time, since they're uniformly worthless and distorted, you can use it as a comparison as well. So in the in 1960s, China's uh, per capita income was about $90. At that time, Ghana's was 183 And today, of course, you know, Ghana is still Ghana. China is now... A global part. power, right. 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 And because China, unlike African countries, China, after expelled um, uh, European uh, uh, adventurers and colonialists, uh, exercise control over its resources and is dictating. It engages the rest of the world on its terms, on terms that it has some influence and impact over which African countries, not a single African country does. Do you think, and I want to get to the United States and AFRICOM okay. and this new yes. generation uh -huh. of colonial influence of U.S. and Africa, but before we, I mean, part of the reason, obviously, that China can do that mm. is just because at the end of the day, it 
it, it is, yes, it's thrown off its own colonial imperial history, but it's a massive, I mean, it's the largest country, certainly by population, I'm mm -hmm. sure, in the world. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I'd be super embarrassed if I'm getting that wrong, but mm -hmm. China is huge. Um, does Africa, or I would add Latin America and the Caribbean for that matter, and people like Kwame Nkrumah and right. CLR James mm. in a Caribbean context seem mm. to point towards this, then they need to, and I think, and, and Lula and Chavez right. certainly look towards this. Do you need to see much more powerful continental and regional integration in order to accumulate that just kind of raw mass of coordination right. that China is able to do because of, of its scope. Of course, absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. people have advocated this. Um, I'm reading right now, accumulation on a world scale. I read it in college, but now I'm reading it. It's, it's like I'm reading it for the first time. <laughs> Who wrote so, it? Uh, it was uh, Samir Min. Okay, yeah. I strongly yeah. recommend if people want to ease into Samir Min, they could watch his lectures on YouTube. Mm -hmm. They're just phenomenal. Um, I just realized as I'm reading him now that when I was in college, I didn't understand what I was reading. Because <laughs> it's almost like reading. <laughs> Happens a lot. At least so, to me. I so like, oh, he, was a, he was a big fan of that. And he said, in fact, in order for African countries to retain a substantial portion of the surplus, and that just means, you know, if you have copper, you want to uh, maximize the profits that remains in Africa. You have to obviously have independent, non-World Bank, non-IMF sources of financing. Right. Because in order to maximize your benefit from those resources, you have to use them as inputs in domestic production. So you don't just get the copper and load it up on ships after it's uh, extracted from the earth and ship it to you know, Europe or China um, in mass form. You want to use that to manufacture products. And when you do that, you're building factories. You're creating skilled employment. And by creating skilled uh, uh, employment, you're uplifting the income level of, uh, of your citizenry. And they, in turn, have more money to now spend on other aspects of your domestic economy. Right. But in order to do that, you need capital. Right. And if you go to the World Bank or the IMF, you know what they're going to do. They say, cut subsidies on education, cut subsidies on health care. So you have in African countries now, people dying of treatable diseases. You know, forget HIV, AIDS and stuff like that. Malaria. People mm -hmm. die of malaria because they cannot go to clinics that used to be free because the World Bank says in order for you to get loans, you have to do A, B, C. They call it structural, structural adjustment. Adjustments. You know, right. it's, 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 it's outright murder. Yep. So Samir Amin was saying in order to, to avoid that, number one, you need to, uh, you know, cut down on, on the corruption because that will also provide, you know, some sources of domestic funding. Right. But that is, is a relatively insignificant portion. The bigger portion is cut down, is, is go to countries like Brazil. Brazil is now an emerging, uh, I wouldn't call it power yet, but it's an emerging economy. Right. And it has significant uh, uh, funds. And in his analysis, Samir Amin also included China, actually. Yep. And says so because China also wants to be part of a um, or a um, a uh, organization, whether it's formal or informal. I think they were starting BRICS. Remember? Yeah, the BRICS, right. and then also this whole Astana process right. with the Belt and Roads connecting. Right. I, I mean, Africa through Europe ultimately, but right. all of the Central Asian caucuses and right. yeah, right. So he was suggesting yeah. that could be an alternative source of funding. It would not come with the conditionalities of the World Bank, right. and finally, African countries would be able to industrialize. And in order to do that, as you suggested earlier, you have to um, 
you have to increase your bargaining position with the rest of the world, number mm -hmm. one. Number two, by coming together, maybe regionally first and then continentally, you now risk, you now avoid the risk of exposing yourself to assassination, <laughs> like we saw in the case of Thomas Sankara. Yep. Thomas Sankara uh, came to power in 1983, and for people are not too familiar with his background, I suggest they, you know, just research, do some Google, go to YouTube and watch. And we've There's done multiple film. really good videos on Thomas ah, Sankara, excellent. including with you. We clipped an excellent overview. And there's a podcast we did on Thomas Sankara together. Very good. So I yeah, suggest yeah. people look him up. And what he wanted to do in the few years that he uh, was in power from 1983 to 87 in Burkina Faso was to first decolonize the minds of his citizens, which many African countries need, which many Africans in diaspora need. And this is to believe that they can do for themselves without having to wait for the green light from France. Right. You can grow your own food before the era of colonialism, which is relatively recent, actually, the last 20 years of the 19th century. That's when the colonial regime was imposed in Africa. You were growing your food centuries before that. So you had to remind them of that. And within three years, Burkina Faso was... Um, was independent, food sufficient. You produce your own uh, outfit. You can become active in, in controlling the environment, which was eating up the soil, plant trees, they plant 10 million trees. He made them participants in their own destiny and they got to believe in themselves. So that itself was a problem. You know, the neo, the people that control the neo-colonial regimes in France don't like that kind of example. Yeah, it's a good example for the rest of Africa, but it's a sort of bad example if you want to maintain a neo-colonial regime. But what became his death warrant was when he attended the 1987 Organization of African Unity meeting in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia. That's the group that uh, preceded the African Union. And uh, there's, a, there's a video on YouTube if people looked, Sankara mm -hmm. and OAU meeting 1987, they'll see his speech. And it's in French, but there's subtitles. And he said, we need to do something about the debt, the collective debt that is burdening the entire continent. Can we find that, guys? Yeah. Let's, we let's cannot, play a to that. Yeah. We cannot uplift the quality of life of our citizens so long as, unless we deal with that. Yep. But if I challenge these lending countries, you know, these institutions and Europe individually, I will not be alive to attend next year's uh, conference. But if we do it collectively, and he says this, and you know, if we do it collectively, they cannot assassinate all of us. Mm. And you see the African president kind of nodding and chuckling and clapping because they knew he was speaking truth to power. But guess what? He did not even live till the next year. That was in July, in October, he was dead. So when it comes to the issues of Africa being able to generate financing that is not tied to the World Bank, IMF, being able to reduce or eliminate the debt burden and actually industrialize, that is seen as a challenge that cannot be tolerated because that would mean reducing the income of these major banks um, that can't be tolerated. Africa industrializing, meaning the 70% that, as I said earlier, of exports you know, from Europe to African countries would now have competition. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, it boils down to greed. The wealthier industrialized countries see any diminishing in the uh, income in those countries as a threat. And any African leader who seems to have the knowledge, the will, determination, uh, the credibility to start initiating that process, 
uh, they're nipped in the bud. It happened historically. It happened with Kwame Nkrumah when he said number one, and for people not too familiar with Kwame Nkrumah, the first leader of independent Ghana. Ghana was the first of the British colonies um, in so-called Black Africa to win its uh, independence in 1957. And he said the independence of Ghana alone is meaningless unless all African countries become independent and they unite. Because if we don't do that, they will continue needing our resources the same way they did prior to independence. So they will go to every measure to make sure that they have access to resources, including direct military intervention, including using some African countries to undermine those that want to take a different path. And of course, the example I just gave you was Ivory Coast undermining uh, Burkina Faso. Here it is, just what you're talking about. Very Here's good. Thomas Sankara. Uh, if you're listening, you will have to watch the audio because it's with subtitles. Yes. But we'll play about a minute or two of this. Sorry. Des révolutionnaires comme des non-révolutionnaires, des jeunes comme des vieux. Je citerai par exemple, Fidel Castro a déjà dit de ne pas payer. Il n'a pas mon âge, même s'il est révolutionnaire. Mais je pourrais citer également François Mitterrand qui a dit que les pays africains ne peuvent pas payer, les pays pauvres ne peuvent pas. Je pourrais citer Madame le Premier ministre. Je ne connais pas son âge et je ne je m'en voudrais de le lui demander. Mais c'est un exemple. Je voudrais citer également le président Félix Oufouet Boyi. Il n'a pas mon âge. Cependant, il a déclaré officiellement, publiquement, qu'au moins pour ce qui concerne son pays, la Côte d'Ivoire ne peut pas payer. Or, oh, la Côte d'Ivoire est classée parmi les pays les plus aisés d'Afrique, au moins d'Afrique francophone. C'est pourquoi d'ailleurs il est normal qu'elle paye plus en contribution ici. <laughs> yes. So that's exactly it. And you can obviously see the clarity. Yes. Yeah. And you can tell without even looking at the camera panning to the other leaders, you can hear the reaction. Yes. That they're actually appreciating and agreeing with what he said. Right. But when it came to soldiering forward. When he looked back, there was nobody behind him. No other African leader supported that, even though, as you heard from the clip, individually, they would make statements saying, you know, this debt has to go. Uh, so Thomas Sankara eliminated. Uh, Kwame Nkrumah eliminated. Patrice Lumumba eliminated. in uh, Congo in the most vicious way when he basically approached uh, Union Meniere, which was the Belgian mining giant, which was benefiting from the Congo's tremendous wealth. Congo's estimated wealth today is estimated at $27 trillion with a T. So he wanted to renegotiate these contracts, of course, and uh, he was viciously killed for that. He was in power only for three months, was overthrown, and then delivered to um, his nemesis, the uh, U.S. Western puppet, uh, Moist Chambay, who, with the encouragement and support of France, had, uh, had started a secession movement in Katanga. Katanga at that time was uh, believed to be the wealthiest province with all the copper. Now, resources have been found <laughs> all over the country, including Eastern Congo. But he was killed in the most brutal manner uh, because you want to elicit history on this that I would recommend yeah. people watch with yeah. Milton leading us through it and Vic producing it. It's an incredible piece of work. You just watched a Michael Brooks show video. Subscribe to get them all. Why wouldn't you? Don't be foolish. Click subscribe below and become a patron as well. Patreon.com slash TMBS. Thanks, everybody.